Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to our third in a series of public lectures hosted by the Irish Gerontological Society of Aging. I'm Roseanne Kenny. I'm president of the Irish Gerontological Society. Um, I'm also Regius Professor of Medicine in Trinity College in Dublin, and my area of interest, in addition to my clinical practice, is the aging process. Um, I am joined as co-chair by my colleague, Deirdre Lang, who is a senior nurse within the HSE, nurse practitioner. She has also done a whole lot of work, and particularly in raising awareness regarding the importance of mobility and aging, and spearheaded a program that I think many of you will be familiar with, Get Up and Get Dressed. In other words, getting people moving as soon as possible um, when inpatients in hospital, a time when frailty and low mobility can quickly, quickly set in. Um, so Deirdre will chair the second half of the meeting with the panel uh, of discussants and introduce them to you later on. But for now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, who is Professor Shane O'Mara, again, a friend and colleague at Trinity. He is Professor of Experimental Brain Research at Trinity. And a, in training, he is a psychologist, neuroscientist, and a writer. And it is particularly in his latter capacity that we've invited him to share his skills and knowledge with you today. He's uh, a graduate of uh, University Galway, and where he did his undergraduate training and then went to Oxford to complete his PhD. His research interests over the last number of years have focused on two concepts within the brain, which is memory, stress, depression, for example, and brain in the world. In other words, the brain eyes view of our world. He's published uh, over 140 peer-reviewed paper, papers, science papers, and written for a number of different newspapers and journals. Um, it, the book that he is most recently renowned for is In Praise of Walking, which I would highly recommend as an informative read of the neuroscience and other science behind the walk, walking process and was uh, voted um, as Amazon.com's number one best seller in 2020. And um, now he's a member of a number of academic societies and is currently working on a book which will be published in later on this year, 2022, derived from his skill sets and own personal research in the context of memory, the stories we tell and how we use memory to create shared realities, cultures and societies. And what's worth knowing in that context. So I hope at a later date, uh, Shane, you will revisit this platform to discuss that, no doubt, also bestseller with us. But without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Shane O'Mara. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Roseanne, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to come and speak to you uh, all today. I hope uh, the, uh, the talk informative and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion and the questions uh, afterwards. Uh, okay, if we could get going with the first slide, if you give me just one second here. We can see that chain. Yeah, great stuff. Okay, so uh, my talk is about walking. And uh, what I'd like to do is start by uh, let, us see, uh, let us having a, a quick view of John Cleese from the Ministry of Silly Walks. And uh, you will have noticed uh, him walking there. Um, and above it is a quote from uh, John Napier, uh, who's a, a, a late but well-known British anthropologist studied walking back in the 60s and the 70s. And he described human walking as a unique activity during which the body step by step teeters on the edge of catastrophe. 
Now I'm going to play Cleese's walk again. And what I want you to do is not look at his feet. I want you to look at his head. And in particular, I want you to look at his eyes and look at the position of his eyes relative to his ears, that, which is a, a tricky thing to do. So let's just play that one more time. Now, as you notice, he throws his leg up, his head hardly moves. He nods at somebody as he walks past. Uh, Napier is wrong. Uh, the body doesn't teeter on the edge of catastrophe, actually. We walk and we walk very successfully um, without too much trouble. And we can do bizarre things when we're walking, including capturing the attention of others while we are doing something silly uh, while walking. And what's particularly notable about Cleese uh, during this little clip is how stable his head is. So the first lesson I want to ask you to take away from this is that you shouldn't think of walking as something you do from the feet up. In fact, you should think of your head as a platform from which your body is hung and it makes contact with the ground. Uh, and this gives you a very, very different way of looking at the world and, and in particular looking at walking than uh, the way you might naturally think about it, which is that it's a from the feet up affair. Now, uh, let's just talk about walking for a moment. We're all land dwellers and it seems very natural for us to think that walking first evolved on land. But we now know that's not correct. And a moment's reflection should tell you that that's not actually correct, despite our land centricness in our, our thinking. Um, there are lots and lots of bottom dwellers uh, who walk on the ocean floor. Uh, here, a couple of examples. I, I love the transparent uh, uh, sea pig on the right, uh, a scavenger that eats uh, waste along the ocean floor. But the key thing here is that these creatures walk and move on the ocean floor without too much trouble, as do crabs and a whole variety of, of uh, other species. Now, a natural and good question is to ask whether the genomic program that's involved in walking in sea dwellers bears any relation to the genomic program that's involved in walking in land dwellers. And this has been studied in some detail uh, just in the last few years. On the left of your screen there, you see a skate uh, which is a fish that moves along the ocean floor by pushing its hind limbs against the sand and uh, can move around quite readily. And on the right uh, is a four-legged animal, the mouse, uh, a, a, a tetrapod as it's uh, referred to as technically. And the question we can ask is whether or not uh, there are commonalities in the genes that control the uh, building of the hips the innervation of the muscles and the movement of joints in the skate, which are shared with the mouse. And it turns out, remarkably, they are just about identical. The mouse has a, an extra copy because it has forelimbs as well as hind limbs. Uh, but apart from that, you can flip the genes that control the development of, of the pelvis and the hind limbs out of the skate and into the mouse, and the mouse will develop entirely normally. In other words, the genomic program that is concerned with walking in uh, the skate and the mouse is more or less identical, despite the last common ancestor of these spe two species uh, occurring at around 420 million years ago. So this is really quite remarkable. And it says to us that nature, when it hits on a solution for something, hangs on to that solution for very, very long periods of time. Now, if uh, you take a trip down to the southwest of Ireland, uh, you'll find something very interesting as well, which is a, the Tetrapod Trackway. And this is uh, well worth a visit. There's a photo I took of it on, on the right uh, of the uh, trackway uh, on Valencia Island. There's only one of four, or this is one of only four known in the world. And this is a, an animal that walked along a drying out riverbed somewhere around about 350 or so million years ago. And what we know of this animal is more or less uh, what you see in front of you, which is a trace fossil, as it's referred to. We don't have its bones, but we certainly do have the motion and the movement that uh, it makes. And that odd looking species you see on the sign on the top left is an anthropo anthropological estimation of what the species must have looked like and what the curvature of its spine must have been like and how it balanced in order to make the moves uh, and the undulating movement that you see uh, in the tracks uh, before you. Now, if we move from evolution to development, evo-devo, as it's sometimes referred to in, 
biology. How do we learn to get up on our own two feet? Well, this has only been studied in really great detail in about the last 10 years or so. Uh, the textbooks of development will give you milestones, but they don't tell you much about what the dynamics of learning to move are. And Karen Adolph in New York and her colleagues have spent quite some time studying the uh, dynamics of how a child learns to walk. And they capture it all in the title of this paper, How Do You Learn to Walk? Well, you do it by learning or by performing thousands of steps and dozens of falls per day. Well, how do you prove that? Well, this is how you prove it. You take a child, uh, maybe of 12 months old, and you bring them repeatedly to the laboratory. You've got lots and lots of things for them to walk on, a gate mat and all the rest of it. And you track them as they move uh, over time um, within a testing session and across time over repeated testing sessions. And what you see is something astonishing, something that we don't really appreciate about how infants learn to make this transition to mobility. The average uh, child has immense locomotor experience, uh, averaging about two and a half thousand or 2,400 steps per hour uh, and about 17 falls typically uh, flopping back, uh, I presume, into, onto their nappy and uh, usually without injury. Uh, this locomotor experience is immense. And I say immense because we, as we will see, adults uh, in the Western world, indeed the world over, take nothing like this amount of, of uh, uh, locom or have nothing like this amount of locomotor experience. Um, and Napier is wrong, as I've mentioned. Um, catastrophe could be defined as falling. But you can fall safely as a child without it hurting you. Uh, and most children are able to do this most of the time and make the transition to movement uh, on their own two feet without too much uh, trouble. And what's remarkable, just to emphasize one last point about learning to walk as a child, to learn to speak, you need to be exposed to a language community. Uh, the genetic programs that control language must have input from the outside world. And this is why you learn to speak Irish or English or whatever language uh, that you learn to speak. You don't need that input from the outside world in order to learn to walk. What you need is space, very little else. And uh, you will learn to walk uh, through the unfolding of that program over that period of time. Now, humans are capable of amazing acts of walking. So here's what I characterize as rough walking. Um, and what you have here is a video. This is from Mary Hayhoe's lab of uh, a chap walking along on a very rough surface. If you watch fell runners, you can see that they're actually very good at running on surfaces like this. So humans are really good at walking on surfaces that are actually very dangerous. These rocks could rock, they could slip, they could fall, but yet we can do this and we can do this uh, with great ease. So how is it that you can do this? So if you look at the, this fellow as he is moving along, you'll see he's wearing a, a computer on his back and he's got various uh, trackers on his limbs and on his head and uh, he comes to the, the final rest point and his walk terminates. Now if we look at where he is looking and how his movement is working, what you see is as you start to walk on a surface like this, you flick your gaze out uh, about two meters and you bring it back and you've made the decision where to place your foot within about a half a second so this is a remarkably fast uh, uh, behavior. And if you look at the dwell time, you look at the spot for a while and then you drop your foot onto that spot. So your gaze on the ground, even though you're not especially conscious of it, tells you or tells your feet where you want them to go. And this is why I emphasize the point that walking should be thought of as a top down, uh, head down process rather than a feet up process. You have to see where are you going to walk on a surface like this or else it will be very, very difficult uh, to do so. But the magic is that you do or you can walk quickly on a surface like this and you can do it um, uh, with ease and you do it based on the, where your eyes are telling you are uh, safe, safe places, places to place, place your foot. So you have this remarkable act of what's called sensory motor or visual motor integration that allows you uh, to move around in the world. Now, how much do you walk? I mentioned that children, as they're learning to walk, walk an awful lot. Uh, well, we know now lots about walking uh, because of smartphones. 
And this is a, a rather lovely paper published in Nature a few years ago, uh, capturing activity right across the world. And what you see is people don't walk very much. Um, the Japanese are probably the best walkers on the planet, putting in around about five and a half or 6,000 uh, steps a day. Uh, no surprise also that they are among the longest lived uh, people, uh, or at least with the highest life expectancy uh, on the planet. And Saudi Arabians walk perhaps the least. And this is not because they're incapable of walking. Um, there are, of course, nomadic tribes in so Saudi Arabia. The actual reason is because the walking infrastructure is so poor. And we can show this uh, effect of the environment on people's capacity to walk very easily. And one way to do it is to look at the walkability of cities. Uh, there is a walkability index uh, available for every major US city. And cities that score high in walkability are cities that have lots of walking going on in them. Um, whereas cities that score low in walkability are cities that have uh, relatively little uh, walking going on in them. So the infrastructure that's available makes a marked difference. And New York, uh, one of the US's oldest cities, scores very highly on the walkability index and people walk lots there. Boston similarly, San Francisco similarly, but places like uh, Fort Worth in Texas or Atlanta, uh, which are nightmares for walkers, uh, are places that people don't walk, they drive, uh, because this is the only way uh, that you, you can get around. So walking uh, is, shouldn't be thought of as just an individual phenomenon. It depends on the environment that you live in uh, as well. And uh, we can, just to, to focus a little more on walking, there's been lots of studies uh, over the past few years on people who live non-mechanized uh, lifestyle and uh, our lifestyle. So this is uh, from uh, uh, David uh, Raiklin and Herman Ponser's group. And what they do is, is fit Hadza hunter-gatherers with uh, uh, trackers and uh, they track the amount of walking uh, that they do and they, what you have are scatter plots of the amount of steps that Hadza uh, tribes people take um, uh, by age. And what you can see is that some Hadza walk astonishingly large uh, numbers of steps, maybe up to 50 or 60,000 uh, steps uh, a day, which is a, a really remarkable uh, amount of walking. That's of the order of 40 kilometers. And there's a lesson to be learned from that. Humans adapt really quickly to walking a lot. Um, uh, you can walk 20 kilometers a day, day in, day out, and your body will adapt in a, in a couple of days. However, learning to run 20 kilometers a day, day in, day out, is something that's actually very difficult uh, for your body to do. Um, so you can adapt to the rigors of walking much more easily than you can to the rigors of uh, running. Uh, now, it's often said if you're... Uh, uh, feeling in slightly bad form or something that maybe you should just take a walk and walk it off. Um, and is there any good evidence for that? Well, there's actually lots of evidence. So what I'm going to do is, is talk about two very different studies at two very different scales, uh, which uh, demonstrate this. But the, the literature very generally shows that physical activity has a very profound effect on uh, uh, how you feel. Uh, over the, uh, the, the uh, short and long term. So this study uh, conducted at Iowa State University is a, is a very simple and, and quite clever one. Um, students were invited to come to the lab and uh, their job was very simple, to be divided into one of two groups. One where they go around and look at the buildings of the university and rate how lovely they are or otherwise, or to sit and look at pictures of those same buildings. And they filled in some questionnaires beforehand about how they're feeling and how uh, much of a change they might feel as a result of having gone for a walk. And what you find is that people who walk without realizing that they're walking as part of a study um, report uh, a big boost to their positive feelings uh, as a result of having uh, undertaken that walk compared to people who have sat for a very similar period of time. Getting up and moving does make you feel better, even though it might be difficult to overcome the inertia of wanting to get moving. And this turns out to be true, even in the condition they referred to as the dread walking condition. That is, 
people who allege that they hate walking, they still feel better as a result of having walked. They show a marked decrease in negative feelings and a marked increase in positive feelings as, re as a result of, of uh, getting out there and moving. Uh, and large scale studies confirm the same. So this is a, a major study conducted in, in Australia. And uh, in this study, they show that uh, if people engage and uh, walking was the most uh, common form of physical activity measured, that if people engage in as little as one hour uh, of extra walking per week, that this would reduce the number of cases of depression in the population at large uh, by about 12%. This is actually a very large effect size. Uh, it's a, approximately equivalent to the effect that you would get from drug treatment or uh, from cognitive behavior therapy, which is a, a really major claim. But the key point here is that uh, getting regular uh, exercise provides protection against future depression. Now, this study didn't find such an effect for anxiety, but other studies have. So it may be down to the test instruments that they were using in this study. Now, it's often said that uh, walking is good for you in terms of creativity. And if you survey the biographies of, of uh, uh, writers and poets and others, you'll find that they spend a lot of time walking. Um, so a good question is what happens to the mind in motion? So this is a picture of uh, Sir William Rowan Hamilton, probably Ireland's greatest mathematician. Uh, and he invented a, a type of mathematics known as quaternions. Uh, he invented lots of other maths. The Hamiltonian is a constant that's used in physics uh, to place space satellites, uh, for example. And the uh, mathematics of, of quaternions are very alien. They're very odd. Uh, three plus four in quaternions is not equivalent to four plus three. Uh, but the reason we can speak to you today, or we can see each other and talk to each other today, is actually because of quaternions. Uh, they're used in computer graphics and computer gaming, and also in your electric toothbrush. Uh, so they've got lots and lots of uses, uh, although at the time they appeared a little bit uh, nonsensical. Uh, Hamilton used to walk from Dunsink in North Dublin to Trinity uh, most days, a walk of about two hours. And one day, lacking a pen, but having his, his tobacco knife, he realized the fundamental quaternion equation and cut it into a stone on Broom Bridge so he wouldn't forget it. And every year there's a walk to celebrate this uh, discovery. He uh, was to write, uh, I, I think, a really beautiful sentence. Uh, Here there dawned on me the notion that we must admit in some sense a fourth dimension of space for the purpose of calculating with triples. And this is the key point where creativity is concerned. An electric circuit seemed to close and a spark flashed forth. So walking actually in uh, Hamilton's eyes may have been the thing that uh, gave him the time he needed to contemplate uh, the ideas that went into the discovery of quaternions. Now, a good question is, will walking make you more creative? And happily, we now have a, a pretty large literature showing that indeed this is the case. So if you take people to uh, the laboratory and you give them what's known as a divergent uses task so they have to come up with as many uses for common household objects in a, in a couple of moments um, you might be uh, given pictures of a can of beans a bag of sugar a paper clip uh, a pen and you have to come up with as many uses for each of these in 20 seconds each as you possibly can what you find is that people who have been walking for a short period whether on a treadmill or just on the corridors uh, walking in a, in a circle, uh, generate about twice as many ideas uh, as people who've been seated for the same period of time. And it turns out that this is also true in people who are older. So a, a very nice study a couple of years ago in a group in Taiwan compared uh, walking in people in their late 60s and early 70s to people in their early or late teens and early 20s. And they found that actually uh, older adults benefited from uh, this period of walking uh, prior to engaging in creative thought uh, just as much as uh, younger adults. And they, uh, older adults came up with about twice as many ideas uh, as did the uh, seated uh, younger adults. So if you're stuck in a problem, get out there and uh, do a little bit of walking. It, it, it uh, may help shake the ideas loose for you. Uh, I shouldn't pretend that just because you've gone for a walk that all walking ideas are good ones. Uh, you'll notice the former prime minister 
but one in the UK uh, decided on the snap general election while on a walking holiday. Uh, now, let's uh, come back to the census for navigating the world. Um, a natural question is, how do we get around when we decide we are going to walk somewhere? What sense predominates? Well, there's been lots of investigations of this, and a natural idea might be that vision, as humans are so heavily dependent on the visual system, uh, should depend on uh, inputs from our eyes to help us navigate in the world. And the question is, is that true? Well, what you can do is gather people who've been blind from birth, people who've become blind during the course of life, and normally sighted individuals wearing blindfolds and compare their performance uh, on tasks where they have to walk uh, two limbs of a triangle and then walk back to the origin, uh, a fairly straightforward task. And what you find is that irrespective of your visual experience, there's very little performance difference. People who are uh, who have been blind from birth are pretty much as good at this task as blindfolded people who are, have had normal visual experience. Uh, and the investigators conclude that the results provide little indication that spatial competence strongly depends on prior visual experience. And I, I think this uh, is a really remarkably good message that uh, we should focus on the capacities that people have rather than capacities that people uh, might have deficits with or problems with, um, that there's uh, an enormous amount of things that people uh, are capable of doing and should be given the opportunity uh, to do. Now, how is it that we're able to do this? Well, one of the reasons is straightforward enough. Uh, I've mentioned already John Cleese and his uh, silly walks. Um, the key point there is straightforward enough. Uh, in the brain, you have a, a system known as the vestibular system, which uh, allows you to rec uh, represent, for want of a better word, or encode the movement of the body as it moves around. However, it does need to be recalibrated uh, from time to time. It turns out when you study people walking in fog or walking in, in uh, forests with uh, uh, low cloud cover where they're not able to see where they're going, uh, they end up walking in circles. And this is how people get lost because they don't have a beacon uh, that uh, they can use to correct their movement from time to time. Uh, it's also true when you get people to walk on uh, very large open spaces, you eventually start to walk back on yourself when you're blindfolded uh, because you need uh, something external. It can be, uh, use the word beacon, it doesn't have to be a visual beacon, it can be a sound beacon uh, just as well, uh, and that will keep you walking on a, in a straight line. So the vestibular system is very, very good at keeping you uh, on, a, on a straight path for perhaps a few tens of meters, but it drifts a little and needs to be corrected uh, over time. Now, let's uh, shift gears entirely. Uh, our world is urbanizing, we know this. Uh, a majority of the population of the planet live in uh, towns and cities now, not in the countryside. Uh, there are very few locations left on the planet where there's a majority uh, rural uh, population. Our populations are mostly urban. And that means, in turn, that most of our walking will be urban in towns and cities. Um, our streets used to be terrible for walkers. This is a celebrated poem of London regarding the, the, the uh, emptying of chamber pots on walkers when uh, you're walking around. And at older Georgian buildings, you'll see boot scrapers uh, for people before they walked into the uh, uh, houses uh, in order to uh, scrape detritus uh, from the soles of their feet. Our streets are still quite terrible for walkers. Now, I want to put this in two contexts. Um, one is a straightforward one. Everywhere we look, average life expectancy is rising. It's taken a hit in the last two years because of the COVID pandemic, but in general, the trajectory is, has been uh, up and it's been really dramatic over the course of the, uh, the past century. Uh, life expectancies for a child born now of 80s uh, plus uh, are perfectly reasonable, assuming that uh, we don't set fire to the planet. However, uh, we haven't figured this one into how we design our towns and cities. This is a study from uh, the UK, but uh, Roseanne and the Tilda Project have done a similar study here. 
And uh, what it shows is very straightforward, that most older pedestrians are not able to cross the road in time um, because they have some form of walking impairment and their walking speed is below the speed necessary to cross uh, uh, the road given the uh, uh, signal control junctions that they might be trying to navigate. I think this is a very serious problem and one that uh, actually is a passive problem because people are imprisoned in their homes or are imprisoned in locales where it's safe for them to cross. They're not able to participate in everyday life that uh, younger people are able to because of a simple design flaw in terms of, of uh, signal controlled junctions. This is Galway, uh, where I'm from, and uh, Galway is a city that is remarkably car uh, dependent. And this is a, a, a piece I saw on Twitter not so long ago um, of one of the new traffic junctions uh, where it takes a pedestrian 14 minutes to cross because there are no crosswalks uh, installed. Uh, there are no uh, easy way to get from the uh, one side of the road to the other. And this is, for some reason, thought to be perfectly reasonable. And of course, it's not if you're on foot. Um, and Galway, of course, has a strange attitude to pedestrians. Uh, this is a headline from the Connacht Tribune. Uh, there was a concern that pedestrian crossings at the Spanish Arch, Spanish Arch caused daily backlogs at Locatalia. And of course, why are people in Galway? Well, one of the reasons is to be tourists on foot. Uh, and uh, if you look at the pedestrian or the, the places in, that people wish to visit in Galway, they are places that actually pedestrians congregate. Nobody visits Galway to uh, hang around at the Font Junction. If we look at cities for a moment, what we see is uh, cities, when they are allowed to evolve, are densely packed. They've got lots of shops, streets, intersecting corners. People are on top of each other. People meet each other. Uh, the central gathering hubs, lots and lots of things like that. Uh, and the 20th century brought us a different vision. Uh, this is uh, the Ville Radius, which was never built, uh, uh, or at least a ver like there were versions of it built. Brasilia is one, and Chandigarh in uh, northern India is another, uh, which turn out to be terrible places to live, uh, where you've uh, large apartment buildings, large uh, boulevards, and you've zoning for residential business and industrial districts rather than mixing them uh, all up. Uh, Glasgow went further in going down this route than any other city in Europe, clearing uh, uh, lots of tenement buildings and building uh, lots and lots of, of uh, uh, tower blocks widely separated from each other. And this happened from about the 1950s. And Glasgow has a real problem um, the males on average die seven years younger than the average male does in the UK, and they have a 30% higher risk of dying before the age of 65. And when you compare like for like with deprivation, you still get uh, a huge disparity. And there have been lots of, of uh, studies conducted on this, and one of the uh, major uh, conclusions is that urban planning uh, is at the core of this, um, where people are separated from each other and uh, being forced to live in high-rise buildings. And uh, this uh, has, has caused a wide variety of unexpected uh, uh, health problems in uh, this population. And Glasgow requires a uh, really quite considerable effort to uh, overcome the problems, because once you put these buildings and roads in, uh, you're pricing in or, or building in these other problems uh, and undoing them will really take uh, quite some uh, difficulty. My point generally is that pedestrians are far too often ignored in favour of motorists. And yet, when we go and visit the towns and cities of Europe um, that are ones that are pedestrian oriented, these are places that people want to be. This is Taormina uh, in uh, Sicily. And the acronym I would like you to remember is that is that of ease, that our towns and cities should be easy to move around. They should be accessible to all. That includes people who've got mobility problems. Uh, they should be safe for everyone and they should be enjoyable uh, for all. It's an ideal that's hard to reach, but uh, it's something that we certainly were capable of doing 
uh, before the invention of the motor car, and it's something we can certainly do again if we if we choose. Uh, Paris is reinstituting this idea, the, the 15 minute city, and I was very pleased to see Limerick uh, has uh, started to work on this walkable city idea uh, with residents in Limerick discovering that actually uh, traveling between two points on foot is often much faster than it is uh, traveling between those self same two points in a car. Now, let's ask a question that you've probably never asked yourself. Why do we have a brain? Uh, in other words, uh, brains are metabolically expensive. Um, why did nature give you one? What problem does having a brain solve for you? Uh, this is a, a little animal, uh, uh, the sea squirt, or it will, if it's in the larval stage, it will become the sea squirt. And what's remarkable about this animal is that it has a spinal cord, uh, just like we do. And uh, as it transitions through the course of its life from being a larva to being a fully developed animal, it sticks itself to a rock and uh, it gradually absorbs its own spinal cord and uh, brain as a meal. I think the lesson there is that uh, if you're not moving, uh, bad things are happening in your body. So you do need uh, to have movement to the extent that you possibly can. Uh, so if you're a little bit sea squirty and you like doing this, what effect does this have on you? Well, we have quite a bit of data on this now. So this is uh, from a French group uh, where they took healthy males in their late 20s and early 30s and uh, put them in a, uh, a waterbed uh, where they're supported on all sides for three days. And uh, they measure uh, muscle strength and a, a variety of other muscle, uh, measures of, of muscle capacity. And what they show is that as little as three days of muscle disuse is sufficient to decrease muscle mass, tone and force. Uh, in other words, the phenomenon known as sarcopenia, where you have uh, muscle being replaced uh, by fat and being lost as a result of inactivity. So you really do need to get moving. Now, coming back to the brain for a moment, there, we know now lots of the lifestyle factors that promote health or uh, healthy brain function. And movement is a really key one. Sleep is very important. Social engagement is, diet is, but I, I, and so is education. But I want to focus on movement for a moment. Uh, a really important study in the last couple of years has focused on dementia prevention. Uh, this is the Lancet Commission. And uh, what they've done is focus on the question of, of what is it that we can change over the course of life that can make it less likely for you to succumb to dementia. And at the core of their recommendations is uh, exercise. You can see here in the Venn diagram that they've placed movement at the center of their recommendations. And it has remarkable effects on lots and lots of other things that are going on in the brain and body. Uh, you get reduced brain inflammation. Um, you get uh, the chance to engage in, in uh, building a larger social network because you're moving around in the world. You have a decrease in depression. There are lots and lots of other things going on. But exercise uh, or movement is, and regular exercise is the key lesson that they uh, wish uh, people to understand. And their estimate is that if these kinds of uh, changes were made that we could reduce the incidence of dementia by about 40 percent. This is uh, a remarkable claim and one that the literature uh, stands up. Uh, we do not have a drug treatment to reverse dementia. Uh, we're as far away now as we ever were from doing that. Much better to have public health changes that prevent it from happening in the first place. Uh, there are lots of other things that I, I'm not going to talk about much today, but a key thing is that we now know that uh, engaging in, in exercise, engaging in contractile movement of the muscles uh, produces molecules known as myokines. These are therapeutic in a whole variety of ways. Uh, they build strength and resilience in the brain and in the body. So there's two-way traffic from the brain out and uh, from the body in. And movement is also really important where uh, and the immune system is concerned. Engaging in regular aerobic exercise, but also in regular uh, resistance training, lifting 
weights a few times a week uh, has a marked effect on activation of the, uh, the immune system and assists in uh, immune function. And uh, it's also now known uh, um, from this and many other studies that engaging in physical activity can boost the activity of the immune system and boost the performance of uh, uh, vaccines and decrease uh, your infection risk. So getting out there and getting moving uh, actually is a good thing uh, for you. So I'm going to uh, finish up now. Um, being Homer Simpson is not good for you. Um, however amusing Homer uh, himself might be. This is what we should be doing, getting up and moving much more uh, than we do in our uh, everyday lives. Consider the child walking 2,000 steps per hour versus the adult walking 4,000 steps per day. But an adult in a non-mechanized society walking 20,000 steps per day. We can do much more uh, than we are actually doing. Um, my book is in praise of walking. If you're interested, uh, you can get uh, regular uh, online newsletters from me at uh, this site, brain.substack.com, uh, where I, I write about life through a neuroscience lens. And my new book has undergone a, an evolution since I was telling Roseanne about it. Its title is now Neurons to Nations, and I hope this will come out next year. And it tries to tell the story how we can get from individual brains to the marvelous uh, societies that we have around us. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Shane. And uh, it's great to uh, meet the author of the book, which I have bought and read and uh, I have to say I highly recommend it to anybody who's interested in living a longer and healthier life. Um, so thank you so much for that really interesting um, uh, talk and we've learned loads from hearing from you. I just want to introduce our panel now and we really have a wealth of experience and expertise and interest in this area and our panel so we're going to have a really robust and interesting conversation and I'm really excited to hear where this goes. So I'm going to get people to introduce themselves. I'll call them out as I see them on the screen um, and um, they just let us know a little bit about themselves so you can see the richness of their knowledge and experience that they're going to share with you. So I'll start with you, Elaine. Hello, my name is Elaine Murta. I'm a lecturer at the University of Limerick and I have a particular interest into research into walking, both the health benefits of walking and research into walking intensity or pace and the different effects that may have. Yeah, and your research actually informed some of the guidelines on, um, on physical activity for Public Health England and the US, I believe. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, I'll move on now with to Noel. Hey everybody, my name is Noel McCaffrey. I'm a doctor and I'm involved in exercise medicine and my particular interest is in the role of exercise in treating and well many enhancing quality of life in people who have long-term illness. It's called chronic illness rehabilitation, in which obviously walking has a key role to play. So I'm very interested in today's talk. And I know, uh, Noel, that you've seen many people recover through your exercise programme, so you've got a wealth of experience to share with us as well. Thanks for being with us. Claire. Hi, my name is uh, Claire Smith. I'm a physiotherapist working with older people in Beaumont Hospital. So yeah, the talk that's really interesting for me today as well. It's great to see it talk like this. And my interest, I suppose, is getting people moving and keep, keeping people moving as well. Excellent. Thanks a million. And Lorna. Hi, um, I'm a dietitian uh, working with older persons in an integration care team in Tipperary. Um, and today, again, was so interesting for me because I like to combine, I suppose, activity and um, eating patterns and healthy eating to promote physical and mental health in the older person. Well, while we're with you then, Lorna, there's a great question that's come in and it talks that it says that in praise of walking looks at both the positive effects on both muscle health, but also on our cognition, that it improves our mood. But does it have any effect on our diet? Um, yeah, so, so there would be, I suppose, a lot of um, uh, research out there regarding uh, diet and probably very much diet combined with um, movement and physical activity. And usually um, 
patients would be would come to me on a day to day basis. Um, you would look at kind of you know I suppose their their meal pattern, their um their variety of their diet, and kind of you know this idea of getting regular eating in and you know, combining it with physical activity so that you know they're not having these long fasts during the day and then maybe physical activity during the day so what you would look at is you know that they're getting adequate protein in during the day and overall just looking at this good variety and balance of diet so protein seems to be coming across strongly there in what you're saying yes uh protein comes up a lot around the timing of protein um and this would very much would be when we're looking at muscle health so muscle health would like to time the amount of protein kind of protein rich foods in the diet we would aim for at least two meals in the day to have protein um but we'd always aim for about three if we could so that would be maybe your egg with your breakfast in the morning maybe your chicken sandwich at lunchtime and maybe some meat then at your at your dinner time um and it's all about this kind of idea where we kind of lose muscle as we get older and what we want to do is preserve the muscle and what really protects it is um I suppose working the muscle through movement and then feeding the muscle through a good diet. That's brilliant. Thanks a million. And um, Elaine, um, Linda Malloy has asked how much walking is recommended per day for the over 70s. So would you have any advice? Certainly. And um, the guidance that we have on walking comes from the World Health Organization recommendations for physical activity in general and they recommend that older adults and it's the same recommendation as adults above the age of 18 should do at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity um, across a week and of course walking is the ideal form of moderate intensity physical activity because you can perform it as part of your daily routine it doesn't require any special skills or or special clothing most people can integrate it quite easily into into their day so that's for also we're looking at a minimum of 150 minutes so if you were to do a 30 minute walk on five days of the week that would meet those guidelines of course more is better so if you're able to do even more walking, that's great. And But it's worth bearing in mind for people that perhaps are not engaging in any walking or physical activity at the moment, any activity is better than none. So if you're able to gradually build up to getting up to 150 minutes a week and even exceed that, that's also good for your health. And does pace matter? Because um, um, Audrey O'Carroll has asked, is it any kind of walking or is it just done when it's done at a moderate or fast pace? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the public health guidelines recommend this moderate intensity activity. So um, most adults actually intuitively select moderate intensity activity for walking for adults. If they're doing the equivalent of about 100 steps per minute, that's moderate intensity activity. So if you think of the song Staying Alive by the Bee Gees, the tempo of that is 100 beats per minute. So if you were to match your, your steps to the tempo of that song, you're probably doing moderate intensity activity. Oh, that's really helpful. That, I must remember that when I'm out walking yeah. myself. Um, so can I just ask uh, Shane, we were talking earlier, and uh, there's a question here from Denise. Does walking release endorphins in the brain? Yes, so there's a complicated answer to this. And uh, I, I think the first thing we should do is stop talking about endorphins. Um, endorphin it means endogenous uh, morphine or morphine related uh, compounds. And they, there's no good evidence that that's true. Uh, you might get a walker's high, but you don't know the, the reason for it. For the very simple reason that we can't sample the neurotransmitters in your brain uh, because uh, you might have an objection to a needle being placed deep into the center of your brain to uh, take them out, uh, to sample them. What we do know is that uh, when you, you uh, get people to wear uh, devices that will allow you to measure the electrical activity of, in the brain, uh, if you get people to wear devices that will allow you to sample blood uh, from them having engaged in activity, so you can get some of the, the, the messengers that are sluicing around uh, in the in the blood, what you see is uh, changes uh, in molecules like the ones I've mentioned already, uh, the myokines, but also in an exercise induced molecule, uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor. And we know from a whole variety of studies, probably thousands in the literature now, uh, that uh, BDNF is released as the result of uh, activity 
and it enhances the function of parts of the brain that are concerned with learning and memory. Um, and you can demonstrate this in all sorts of ways. We did a study a few years ago uh, on young males, putting them on site on bikes and getting them to do forced exercise and measuring brain derived neurotrophic factor in their blood. Uh, you can do brain imaging, you can do lots and lots of different things. But the, the key point is that uh, uh, the molecules really to be concerned about are these molecules that are concerned with plasticity of the brain, BDNF being the, the prime one, uh, but also myokines, which are mo um, molecules released from muscle as the result of, of movement. And uh, of course, uh, rhythmic activity is good for you for all sorts of reasons. Walking rhythmically with another person is, is a good thing. Walking in nature uh, is a good thing as well. You, you get a sense of awe and well-being from being out uh, in uh, uh, green environments. Um, this is probably, I, I guess, why walkers or golfers like golf because they're out in this lovely verdant uh, uh, landscape. Uh, so you can get all of these positive effects from literally being out and about, uh, being in sync with other people and taking a view of nature. That's great. Thank you very much. And Noel and Claire, I'm going to put this to both of you because Joan Murphy has asked us, her aunt of 88 years is having difficulty with her walking and how can we help her to improve her mobility because walking was her total enjoyment before COVID. So I'll start with you, Noel. What would you say to Joan? Well, I think the first thing for Joan is to do it. Um, and from speaking with, with Shane earlier before this talk, the idea of the less you do with regard to mobility in general as you age, and particularly in the context of having any form of underlying chronic illness, the less you do, the worse you get. Because if you are inactive, then all aspects of your fitness just improve, including your strength, your aerobic fitness, your flexibility. And if they just improve enough in each of those domains, you have a noticeable effect. So if your strength disimproves, you have difficulty standing up. If your aerobic fitness disimproves, you have difficulty doing the housework and doing the gardening. And if your flexibility disimproves, you have difficulty dressing. And the net effect of all of that is reduced mobility and social isolation and loneliness, which makes the whole thing worse. So the critical thing is to not let yourself stop. And if you have stopped and have lost confidence, is to find a way to resume walking in a safe way, in a safe environment and an enjoyable environment, which usually involves having company and supervision and encouragement. And it's not difficult. Um, some of the, some, sometimes if you've lost strength in your pelvic muscles or your quads muscles, a little period of strength work or dedicated strength work prepares you to resume walking and gives you back the mobility and the confidence to actually do it. But the critical thing is to keep doing it. And, um, and I'm interested actually in discussing with Shane or asking him to comment on if you don't walk or if you discontinue walking, do the control mechanisms that control walking themselves go asleep and become less effective? And is it a sort of vicious cycle? So I, I think maybe we could, Shane might come back to that um, if he gets a chance. But I, I think the main message here is to find a way to keep doing it or to resume doing it. And if that needs a bit of preparation by way of strength work first, great. And if it needs company or support, great. But get at it again. So Claire, I just ask you from your physio perspective and um, Noel's mentioned the strength piece. Um, what would your advice to Joan be for her aunt? Yeah, I think I would definitely echo what Noel said there now, but I suppose as well, maybe adding balance work into that. Is when we do look at the physical activity picture, it's a mix of doing your strength work, balance work, and moving as well. So really, again, yeah, it is to find whether you need to do it with someone where you're practicing even standing up from a chair, practicing just your static kind of standing work, but then also adding in more dynamic balance exercises as well so whether that's at the start where you're just taking a step out in front and stepping back really starting small but building up the same way as we we do when we're trying to start moving in general starting small but building all the time so I really think it's trying to mix the three trying to do your balance your strength work and moving as well and like there's loads of things out there as well when you look at you know doing it with someone whether it's a family member or talking to 
for your GP and we're seeing a lot more kind of even social prescribers in the community now as well which is great because it opens more avenue for people to go and meet others who are interested in moving and doing activity as well so I would say trying to see for specific people sometimes it's balance alone but yeah Excellent. Thanks a million. Um, can we come back to you, Shane? Because no, I know Noel is dying to hear your answer to his question. Yeah, so there's, there's really a kind of two ways to think about this. One is, is the view from the brain out and uh, from the world in. So if you think back to, to John Cleese at the, at the start and the Ministry uh, for Silly Walks, his head is stable in space, even though his legs are doing all sorts of weird things underneath them. Um, and as you get older and if you're not active, um, your ability to keep that stability gradually uh, diminishes and your, the chances of falling uh, go up and frailty accompanying that might make the fall more injurious. The good news, and it's really good news, is that this system can be recalibrated and is recalibrated, as, as Claire has said, by activity. Um, so we know that activity uh, in the vestibular system drives things happening right throughout the brain. Um, and we can show this in a whole variety of ways. But if you stimulate the inner ear, uh, it's not just a signal in the inner ear. You see activity in brain areas that are very remote from the inner ear uh, that are involved in learning, involved in attention, involved in memory. And the key thing is that if you get up, get moving, get the practice in that's been mentioned, um, the vestibular system retunes itself in a positive way. Uh, it needs that continual challenge and it needs the challenge of walking on different surfaces. It needs the challenge of, of walking at different pace. This is, uh, it needs the challenge of walking with perhaps if you're carrying uh, weights or whatever it happens to be. Um, and of course, if, if you haven't been moving much, this is a challenge. So walking, I think one of the messages I want to get across is a social phenomenon. Uh, humans did not conquer the world by walking out of Africa, one guy with a spear. It was in groups, in tribes, it was together. And we are really amazingly tuned to each other's movements when we walk. We fall into sync with each other. We breathe at the same pace. People who walk too fast, slow down. People who walk too slow uh, will speed up. So if you're worried, go and walk with somebody Maybe practice a little bit of dancing at home on a soft surface with matting. You know, there's lots and lots of things you can do. But the key message to get across is movement is medicine and movement is really good for you. It comes with benefits uh, that you will not appreciate that, that reach right into the deepest recesses of other aspects of functioning of your brain other than just mere cardiac or mere vestibular health. That's really, really interesting. I think I think the fact that walking is free means we don't give it the same credence that we would if we paid a fortune for the ability to do it. Um, Lorna, you're up again. There's two questions. One is uh, Mary Hegarty had said that traditional Chinese medicine always mentions the benefit of a stroll after a main meal. And that was a great tradition in Ireland when she was growing up in the 60s. Do you have any views on that? Oh, I'm definitely not the expert um, in Chinese medicine. I'm not sure. Um, maybe does she mean like herbals or maybe acupuncture? No, so she, no, she, she means that um, walking after having a meal is actually really good for your digestive system. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I took it that she meant actual, there was Chinese no. uh, medicine. Um, so I, I think for um, what I would find even before or after a meal, I find when for the group that I work with, the older person, especially the older persons who are living with frailty, I find that if they have movement before or after a meal, it actually helps their body to nearly function better. I find that their appetite is better, their mood is better, their interest in food is better, their digestion is better. Um, a lot of the time we come across people who would find difficulty with constipation. So this idea of movement, I suppose, really overall helps the diet probably work a bit better. Or even like a lot of people would suffer with diabetes, they would have a lot of problems and the digestion will be much better so I'm not sure did that theory come from that overall you feel better you're socially you're out and about you have your meal you're more interested in food your appetite is better um but from my experience that is what I find um that there is this better engagement with food when somebody has that kind of outlet and is out and about and is moving a lot more Excellent. There's maybe something to add to that uh, yeah. which is that uh, if you get people to wear glucometers 
and measure blood sugar spikes, um, uh, a po or postprandial blood sugar spike spikes. What you see is uh, people who go for a walk after a meal uh, don't show uh, the sudden spike in blood sugar levels that people who just sit on the couch in a food coma after. Yeah, a, yeah. Uh, have. So yeah. you get a much better metabolic control uh, generally uh, if you can go for a walk after you've eaten. And intuitively, we know this, you know, we know that sitting around uh, after eating is not really good for you. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, of course, we have other tendencies to, to overcome. Yeah. A question that I'm dying to ask. Um, can walking combined with diet realistically reduce visceral fat? So I don't know if does uh, does Lorna want to take that or maybe no? Does it reduce visceral fat? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think exercise combined with attention to diet can do that. Now, whether it needs to be a bit more intense than walking, it, so that, that combination, yes, it can, is the answer. Of course it can. Um, would be the short answer to that, yeah. I, I might make a, a comment on two different or three different societies. So there's, there's been uh, lots of studies, as I've said, on, on uh, non-mechanized uh, people living. So the Hadza in Africa and the Tsmani in, in South America. None of them have obesity. They just don't get fat at all um, uh, because they walk everywhere, you know, between 10 and 20,000 steps a day. Uh, but there's also a, a really fantastic study out of Beijing uh, in the last few years. Um, to get to own a car in Beijing, you are put on a list and your name is chosen randomly. Uh, and uh, what they found is that people who are allocated to car ownership put on several kilos weight over the next two or three years, whereas the ones who don't own a car don't because they have to cycle or walk. Um, and uh, rates of obesity in Japan are among the lowest on the planet, despite high levels of car ownership. But car parking is not allowed on the streets in Japan. You have to use public transport. So the Japanese walk an awful lot and obese Japanese uh, are, are a rarity until they move to uh, Western societies and then have the, all the metabolic problems that come with that. Okay. Um, I know, um, Noel, we were talking earlier and you were interested in asking uh, Shane about the walking pain interaction with people with musculoskeletal issues. Do you want to put that question to Shane? About the walking, the walking office idea, is it? Uh, well, that and the walking pain interaction. Oh, yeah, pain. Yes, Shane. Um, obviously, a lot of the people that we deal with in chronic illness, we have, have pain. Um, about 60% of all the people who attend our program have pain of some sort, and that's not a bit surprising given their age. And the question is often asked about, well, should I be exercising if I have pain? Now, our, um, our observation is that when we ask people who have pain every day since they started our program, which involves exercising twice a week and combining all the elements that were mentioned earlier, that in 95% of cases, the pain either does not change or it gets better. Now, and that I think reflects the change in the approach to treating chronic pain in general. But the question is though, the interaction between um, the act of walking and the experience of pain. Um, would you have any comment on whether the perception of pain is reduced by walking or increased, or does it make any difference? Uh, so that's a, first of all, I'll say I'm not a medic, so I'm not offering medical advice in anything I say. Yeah. Uh, um, so that's a, that's a hard question to answer directly. Um, in general, uh, when you're walking, sensory activity is augmented. In other words, your vision is sharpened, your hearing is sharpened, those kinds of things. And, and we can show this in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, whether the perception of pain is sharpened or not, I don't really know. There have been some studies on uh, calluses on the feet and uh, your perception of, of needle pricks through those calluses when you're moving. And it turns out that people are very sensitive, uh, even though they might have, have quite large calluses. But that's a, uh, an acute rather than chronic pain. So it, 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 it's difficult to say. I think there is a, a more general literature, though, which would suggest that walking uh, produces uh, anti-inflammatory effects right throughout the body. Um, and the kinds of observations you're talking about in your patients probably speak to that, that uh, uh, having a walk is probably as good 
in terms of its anti-inflammatory effect as it is taking uh, anti-inflammatory medication. And it doesn't come with the hepatotoxic uh, problems that, uh, or liver problems that uh, anti-inflammatories might have. So, you know, if you have a headache, can you walk it off more quickly than uh, uh, taking a tablet? The studies aren't very clear on this. It's very hard to do studies like this, but in general, I, I, I would accept your idea that 95% uh, of your patients feel better as a result of it. I, I actually think it's a really important message for anybody listening in that if they're contemplating an exercise program or they're wondering should, they're, should they stop it because they have some knee pain or back pain, that I think it is really important to be aware that the benefits of being regularly active would far, far exceed the discomfort of a temporary, once it's a temporary exacerbation of say the knee pain or the back pain, which then should settle down within a few hours. And if that is, if that is what happens, and if that is what repeatedly happens, following a bout of walking or indeed any other form of exercise, then that's very acceptable. That's very acceptable in terms of general lifestyle. It's a really, really important message because quite naturally people might feel that they shouldn't exercise if it hurts their knee or their back. And that's not true because the benefits are so great. Yeah, I, think that's I would, very important I would definitely I also suggest that there are other forms of exercise. So sometimes if there's acute pain, particularly in the knees, low back, cervical spine, and very common as, as we get older, the, those sites for arthritis. Swimming is, is a very good exercise to take you through an acute pain phase and prepare you for getting back into um, ambulatory uh, exercise. Claire, yeah, no, often, to... yeah, I think often I, I was just going to second really what Noel was saying, because often that's when we see people is when they've stopped moving because they've been afraid that pain is going to exacerbate it by movement. And often then, you know, our message is actually that movement is the safest thing for them to be doing to make sure they keep themselves moving and trying to reintroduce movement and exercise often it's where we come in then at that point but it really is just to echo that that moving and exercise is safe for people to be doing even if they do have things that cause knee pain and back pain so often movement is the best thing for it um elaine can i can i just ask you Second just that. another question um in relationship to your research and, and what you know about the subject we've been asked um sometimes we drive to the gym to walk on the treadmill um does it matter where you're doing your walking um, in terms of, if we talk, if we think about physical health benefit, um, it probably doesn't matter whether you're indoors in the gym or outside, if we're just talking about the volume of activity. However, there is evidence to suggest that what's been coined green exercise or blue. So in the green environment or in a blue environment near the ocean may have more mental health benefits and um, similar to what Shane mentioned in his talk around being in nature, being outside or the co-benefits of being with other people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to touch on something else about the fear of falling. So we've so many older adults in our communities who've restricted their movements from COVID and they are probably less mobile than they have been. Would anybody have any advice for those people who are afraid that they're just less steady on their feet and afraid that they might fall or have had a fall in the last while and are afraid of, of getting back into that walking that they did before? I can jump in there if that's okay there, Dra. Yeah. I suppose, you know, we I do often see people who've come in to a hospital with a fall but it often that fear of falling is the piece which stops people more than anything else so I suppose part of my role is increasing people's confidence and that's really true getting them back doing the things they like but it really is true doing balance exercises getting them walking and seeing what the safety elements are as well I suppose sometimes we do say that people either need to have someone with them while they're walking or they need some element of supervision but even if that is in the home environment, I think it's around trying to remember, you know, how to make things safer, whether that's getting a pendant alarm. If you do have falls that you would have that pendant alarm, because even though we, we are all trying to look at how 
and we prevent falls, I think that we will see falls happen as well. So I suppose it's trying to set yourself up in the best way possible that you feel safe while you are walking around. So I would I would say if you are ex extremely worried and you would like to talk to a physiotherapist or talk to your GP or any kind of health practitioner about fear of falls to access those areas as well. But I think really it's about getting your home set up safely and starting to to do your exercises, you're strengthening, even things like sit to stand exercises where you're standing up from a chair and sitting back down. That in itself can be a great exercise for strengthening those kind of big muscles that you need for walking. So, so I suppose if it's that it's not a fear of falls and you need to speak to a physiotherapist, then do so. But also the small things like getting up from a chair, practicing your standing on the spot for kind of 10 seconds or so can be great as well yeah that's great um something we talked about before we came on was about standing desks and walking desks and i'm standing at my desk because i thought i better put my best face forward i'm often sitting down and i'm sitting down for hours at a time and i was speaking to a gentleman yesterday who was on a walking desk but he wasn't walking on the desk he was walking on a treadmill as he was on the desk and noel and i had talked about this and shane we were just wondering if we could pick your brain on the benefit of that kind of uh, approach to your work day? Yeah, so the, there's actually quite a bit of uh, work in this area. Uh, and one of the things to, to note is that people who stand a lot uh, but don't get to move around a lot during their jobs often have knee problems, they have pooling in the feet, of blood, things like this. So uh, it can actually be quite difficult. And uh, I have experimented with standing desks myself, and actually I've given up on them because. Uh, uh, the, I, I just don't find them conducive to working. However, uh, there is quite a literature on walking desks. I, I don't own a walking desk. I don't have the, the space in the house here to have one, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and the literature there is very positive. Uh, people who walk uh, at walking desks don't get pooling in their feet. Um, they get a very good return of blood uh, from the lower extremities up to the, uh, the body trunk and beyond. Uh, there's there's a, a good return of circulation. And they also tend to show uh, decreases in weight and associated decreases in uh, activity. And I, I think, you know, we, we have very badly designed workspaces uh, in general. Uh, we, we think it's okay to have open plan offices with poor ventilation. And then we wonder why people get sick from respiratory diseases. Um, you know, we have a whole lot of other things going on. And we have a shift in the kinds of work that people are doing. So I was doing a little bit of digging in the literature recently to look at comparisons between uh, the average amount of walking that people in the, the late 1800s did compared to the average amount of walking that we do today, where work going to and from work is concerned. And uh, in London, it was very typically the case that the average male walked between two and four miles to work and two and four miles from work in the late 1800s. Uh, if a male puts in two miles in total in a day to day, we're actually doing very, very well. Um, so we need to think about how we redesign workspaces so that they become more active. Um, I, uh, I have a, a, a simple alarm that goes off every 25 minutes uh to get up and move around so that i don't spend a, a lot of time uh seated and uh, i use the step counter on my phone to track the number of steps uh to make sure i, I crank up the number uh every day um but i do think we we have a big job where uh, reform of workspaces are concerned um as i've mentioned respiratory diseases are a problem open plan offices are terrible for creativity, if you want to do deep focused knowledge work, uh, you won't do it in an open plan office. Uh, you need a, a quiet place where you're not interrupted. So there's lots and lots of other things uh, mm. that we need to think about where uh, uh, work is concerned. Do you mind if I just follow up with a question there for Shane about that? So, so the bit you've addressed there, Shane, is the, the health bit of the walking office. Um, and you've you've reassured us that the pooling and the, the bad effects of standing don't happen if you're on a treadmill beside, say, a laptop. Yeah. What, about, what about productivity or creativity in that form of work compared with sitting at a desk and not actually 
um, walking. Is there any evidence for benefit there? Because obviously that's the other side of this. One is productive or creative work and the other is getting your health kick in without having yeah. to... So I think, you know, the, the general finding is that walking augments uh, creativity um, and uh, treadmill walking uh, does the same. Uh, we don't have good studies of, of productivity at, at walking desks. Uh, simply because the, the population that use them tend to be affluent. When you look at uh, companies that manufacture them, they complain. I, I know because I've spoken to some of them. They complain that the chief executives buy them for themselves, but they won't buy them for their <laughs> workers. Uh, so we have a compositional effect where uh, those desks are, are, are concerned. Um, but, you know, writers like Stephen King and others, they, they walk lots um, and then they write lots. Uh, so maybe you could put the two together. I, I don't know. Um, if, you know, we, we just don't have enough. It's, it's a, it's a subject for, for another lecture, I think. Yeah. I'm just conscious of the time and of everybody's time. And it's been really, really interesting. I think we've learned lots and I hope the audience have appreciated the wealth of your knowledge and experience. I think it's something, Roseanne, we'll have to come back to because I think we could do another hour easily. But I just want to take the opportunity Thank you all for joining us on the panel. And Rosanne, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Wow, well, what an outstanding uh, lecture we have had and panel discussion covering such a broad spectrum of walking related topics. Um, I, 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 I'm sure we'll have great feedback from those of you who've participated. We're enthusiastic to broaden our uh, email base for the public to inform them of future public lectures. And I've no doubt we will be requesting that Shane comes back uh, to tell us of his new book when it's published. And I hope, I hope you will, Shane, because you're a wonderful communicator to the public. Um, we will have on our website uh, within the next 10 days, uh, a, an email address that you can guide your friends to, please to join our Irish Gerontological Society's public lecture email um, group so that they get a uh, notification of when the public lectures are happening, as, you, as will you, because you're already on our email mailing list. And I want to recognize the contribution that the HSE have made to these public lectures uh, to support the public lectures and maintenance of some of our web access for the public, et cetera. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much to Shane for an outstanding lecture and to the superb panel who, who have covered so many, so many walking related topics. Thank you and good day to everybody. Thank you.